Antarctica, a place of scientific research and study and rarely a place for criminal activity. Though at the turn of the century, an Australian astrophysicist came down with a sudden illness before dying a day later. Due to winter setting in, a proper autopsy wouldn't be possible for another six months. Today, we discuss the only cold case and potentially the first recorded murder in Antarctica, the death of Rodney Marks. This is Red Web. Welcome back, Task Force, to another episode of Red Web, the podcast all about mysteries, the unsolved, and the unknown of this world. I am your resident mystery enthusiast, Trevor Collins, and joining me hearing this case for the very first time, Alfredo Diaz. The Thing, sci-fi, horror, thriller, boom, movie ratio, that fast, baby. <laughs> and that has been another episode of Red Web. He solved the case. It's an alien from outer space. Honestly, it does give a lot of The hey, Thing vibes. Yeah, it gave me those vibes. Um... I just can't. Why? People, why are we way out there? Let's just, unfold it. Keep going. I want to know more about your instincts here because you okay, have a lot of preservation it's, it's instincts. Just, it's just like... It, it's we, far. It's cold. We, it's so far. It's so cold. It's so isolated. And like, we do nothing but uncover uh, zombie viruses that have, you know, been iced Not wrong. In, in, you know, in... Uh, and stowed away for for centuries, right? And ancient we, lakes that have not been touched by man hands, and, and now we're like, and it's oh, like let's just, get in, let's just get up in there. Mm, you know I'll what suck I mean? That down with, with no glove, <laughs> with no dawn soap. It's just <laughs> <laughs> no dawn soap. We're not saving penguins or anything here. You're not it's, wrong. It's just it's just terrifying, and I get that man wants to push the the limits, um, for sure. But I feel like. I'm, you know what this this, this damn podcast it did to me. I feel like <laughs> if we should push the limits of our planet, we should do it with the sea. There's so much unexplored with the sea. That's true. And I'm just kaiju. That's it. I'm just gonna put the word out. Like we don't know. Just put the word out. <laughs> it's just it's just so much unexplored in the sea. Absolutely. So let's just stop with. Antarctica. <laughs> I will say it's probably easier. Despite oh, it's way easier. Cold, it's way easier. It's way easier to maintain yourself there than it is in the depths. Oh, hundred, hundred percent. But, but we just put the focus in it. You sure, know I mean? get the, sure. Get the again. James Cameron science, on the horn. Buff scientists, right? right you got just right. a. I'm sure NASA's got a line of buff scientists uh, just ready to figure stuff out. Yeah. And then to back them up is a bunch of other buff scientists training to help them figure stuff out. So just like get them on the horn. Layers of buffed I'm just buffed up scientists. I'm just saying. Yeah. yeah. So knowledgeable that their brains veiny vascular with muscle. Yeah. <laughs> I just it's a it's just crazy because if anything goes down out there, yeah. It, good luck. If you Dude. thought like getting a contractor to fix your uh, water heater or your air your blown out like air conditioning um, it's taking way too long. Just imagine being out there yeah. trying to get. I mean, who do you even you you t you contact Jill or or Philippe down the street who's like the resident one mechanic. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like, there's one person in the town that's like, all right, we fix everything when something yeah. goes down. I hope I'm not, you know, sleeping in today. It's just a whole town. Why? Yeah, it's so cold. Task force, and I really appreciate social media for making this kind of information accessible. It's so cold. You know, there's scientists down there making videos, pouring soda into a glass. And, and by the time it's hitting the bottom of the glass, the whole stream up into the can is frozen. If you go outside without any protective gear, you could like within the minute or two start to hit like shock, right? Because it's so cold. You can That's... start to have dangerous like levels of, of chill hitting you. You can have a, a, a moist towel that you whip out. Yeah, you know, like somebody made a video like where they're, up. yeah, they were like, oh, let's, uh, let's, it's a nice cool day at the beach, opens the door, it's the Arctic tundra, he whips the towel, it's frozen suddenly. Jesus. And he, he had to film it in bits because he would go out and he's wearing like swim, swim trunks or something. Yeah. He had to film it in like five segments just to do a 30 second clip because they had to keep running in. Right, it's too cold. You Can't start crying, your yeah. eyes are going to freeze up. I didn't even think about All that. All sorts of stuff like that. That's, That's what we're talking about. That's true. Yeah. So Man, what if you just... We just pour water down your boy's well, butt then, crack, and then it then just your freezes, butt crack freezes, 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 freezes up. I'm sorry. <laughs> Hope he I don't know why go. my mind went there. <laughs> uh, like, you freeze someone's like butt crack together, like you just constipated your boy. <laughs> 
Sorry. What a what a what a crime. That's the second crime in Antarctica. Okay, yeah. so <laughs> coming to the business at hand. Oh, by the way, we have special guest Nick Bot, our <laughs> editor in the background yeah. today. Hello. Really nice to have you. We are coming up it's a little uh time slippage here, task force. We are coming up on the holidays. You are in the in the midst of a cold January. So that's that you're going to see some like different voices in the room as people are kind of off for the holidays. But yeah, Antarctica, not a lot of crime has happened. There's like five major cases early back to the kind of 50s all the way up into just a few years ago. And each of them either has a suspect or the crime is kind of up in the air. Like the first one back in the 50s was some people say it was a murder. Some people say it was non-lethal. I don't know how we don't have that figured out. But right. this could be. I, I wonder, like, there mm-hmm. has like there should be some kind of study behind that because I wonder why is that so? Well, I think is it's it because, because of the government's in play, oh. the misinformation. This involved the USSR, Soviet Union. Yeah. So there's you're thinking that there's been murders and they just don't report. It's them? possible. Uh, oh. it's, it, and, or it could have been mis, misreported. Things of that nature. Someone got attacked over a chess game with an ice pick. Yeah. And well, then, I'm just thinking, like, I just the. I don't know, right? Because it's a town. Uh, yeah, there's some some towns like kind of like scientific little towns. Yeah, setup, like scientific towns, um, but not like a town you and I would know. They're just right, like right, bases. Right. Yeah, really. yeah, okay, like yeah, bases and stuff like that. Yeah, I, I guess it's not a lot of people there because I was thinking if it was more people. Like, what is the? It's like what is the human mind behind just like not you know i'm assuming low crime rates and stuff like that oh yeah it's just because they're everyone's just like look it's already rough out here in general and like and you're not gonna get away with it kind of thing right yeah how are you gonna get away yeah 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 yeah. well you also have the psychology of loneliness and being far removed from society and when we are social creatures like in such a harsh environment it it's it's very interesting and probably still so much to be studied but Again, depending on, like, this this topic is going to live a lot in the theories. There's a lot to discuss within those theories. But depending on the theory that you subscribe to, this could be the first recorded murder in Antarctica. And it certainly is one of the only, if not the only, cold cases because all the other ones kind of have suspects. This is kind of up in the air. It is a wild case to have such kind of little information as to who and what the motive might have been. But without further ado, we should dive in. But I do want to give a shout out to our first members. If you want this podcast, Red Web, if you want it commercial free, ad free, you want some bonus content that Fredo and I make on the side over on the Rooster Teeth app. Or just want to help keep the lights going. Or you want to keep these uh, these airwaves alive. You can become a first member at redwebpod.com slash first. It's the best way to support us. Oh, and also, like we always do, we're going to put a list of sensitive topics in the description for this episode. But with that said, let's dive in to the death of Rodney Marks. In 2000, 32-year-old Rodney Marks was working for the Amundsen-Scott South Pole Station in Antarctica. So station, there's the word. Got it. This is a U.S. research station that was built in 1956 for geophysical studies, and public research has been governed here by the National Science Foundation. It is the only place on the planet with six months of continuous day and then six months of continuous night. Day lasts from October to March and night last from April to September. That's so wild to wrap my head around. I don't know if I could, I don't know if I could do that. Like, I like I think I'd be good with it, but I don't know what that would do to my psyche. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just constant night. For that severity, when you're at the nor- South Pole, rather, it that's pretty stark. I know there's people like in North Norway who are like, they love that. They love yeah. the twilight of it all. And then it becomes dark for three months, not, not six months. And I know some people that just, thrive in that they love it and then they love summers with longer like three months of sun but that's definitely something to get used to that's a lot i think the the days where it's just sun all the time i think that would get to me like Mm -hmm. nights i can function in nights i could go out work have fun sleep at night you know what i mean um if it's just daylight all the time you're not trying to sleep yeah you got to get blackout curtains but people start to miss the sun you, you kind of would underestimate just how much you would miss those oh, golden rays. Yeah. Now, during night, the temperatures can reach as low as negative 99 degrees Fahrenheit or... Oh, my God. Or negative 73 <laughs> Celsius. Oh, my God. Very cold. Some contract work for Raytheon, a defense aerospace manufacturer, also occurs in this area. So, 
Rodney Marks was an astrophysicist and operated the University of Chicago's Antarctic Submillimeter Telescope and Remote Observatory, aka ASTRO. So whenever I say ASTRO, that's what I'm referring to. And he operated that by himself. ASTRO was able to see extremely small wavelengths thanks to the dry, cold weather of the South Pole. The telescope was located in what is known as the dark sector. It's about one kilometer or 0.6 miles from the living area to limit interference from noise and light. You know, even in the uh, South Pole area, you got light pollution. Now, Marx had operated Astro from 1997 to 98 and returned to work on Astro after the previous operator left due to her diagnosis with breast cancer. On May 11th, 2000, while walking from Astro to the main base, Marx was suddenly struck with illness. Now, remember, this is a almost a uh, little more than half a mile. It's a, a kilometer walk back to base. Yeah. So this is a long, kind of stressful walk in the, in the the given the climate. Right. I, mm, it's just so risky. <laughs> Very risky. On top of that, like I said, he was struck with sudden illness. He had trouble breathing. He was suddenly very fatigued. He had blurred vision. All things you would not want to feel in the midst of a walk like that. I'm sure they do have weather condition like advisories if it's too bad, like you don't make the yeah. walk. But either way, it's still a treacherous kind of business. So Marx visited the station doctor, Robert Thompson, but he was uncertain about Marx's illness. Thompson personally assumed Marx was affected by alcohol withdrawal or suffered from anxiety for various reasons. He told Marx, just get some rest. Maybe we'll see if you're better in a couple of days. You know, I didn't think about that either. Like, you really have probably one person that has a specialty yep. in, in like individual fields, right? Yep. Like if you're one engineer yep. runs into an issue that they can't solve, like, damn. I mean, you have the internet, right? So you can communicate. Now, yeah. Which, so, okay. Like, yeah, that, that kind of helps, but... God, I couldn't imagine being out there in the 50s. Yeah, yeah. No thanks. Like, how you, like, nowadays you can communicate with, through the internet, but if you just have the one doctor and the one doctor can't tell what's going on, you can't go to a different one. You right, know what you mean? can't they get don't... a second opinion. Right, you can't get yeah. a second opinion. There's no doctor down the hall that they can ask. There's no, like, other, like, I don't know, a plethora of nurses or anything mm -hmm. to back them up. Like, oof. Yeah, you better hope he's in network. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a little true. insurance joke. But, <laughs> but seriously, like, uh, it is it is limited. And obviously everybody that's out there is trained and, and highly reviewed because you are the one person that does that thing. Yeah. But I digress. You know, he's... He's sent home, he's gonna go get some rest, see how he feels, and in the next morning, around 5.30 a.m., he wakes up feeling even worse, like his condition is spiraling at this point. He's vomiting blood. He was so sensitive to light that he had to wear sunglasses while indoors, and he felt pain throughout all of his muscles. Marx visited Dr. Thompson again, but the doctor assumed Marx was having now a panic attack and gave him a sedative and in order to get him to get that needed rest. Maybe get him through these immediate symptoms and you know, maybe again, you'll feel better on the other side. I'll be honest. In my non-knowledge of, of, of medical, in the medical field or anything like that, uh -huh. I feel like if you're vomiting blood, you're past the whole just get some rest phase. Right. You know, that right. seems pretty bad. Right. I don't think I've had a panic attack that involved incredible light sensitivity and vomiting blood of yeah. all things. Once you're vomiting blood, there's there's something drastically wrong. Yes. And I don't think it's like a just rest up and take some NyQuil to yeah. and we will do the trick. Right. And it's easy to sit here in hindsight because we, we know we're oh, talking about a yeah. cold case. Yeah. So it's easy to go, well, it's a suspicious doctor activity. Yeah. But, but even then, though, we will like, come back to this in the yeah. theories. Even then, though, I mean, like just the vomiting of blood, man, that's just such a new red flag. It's a big red flag. Yeah. So suffice to say, Marx is still feeling worse. Hours go by, even after taking the sedative, and he's feeling worse, and now he's hyperventilating. This time, the doctor gives him an antipsychotic known as Haldol. 45 minutes later, Marx went into cardiac arrest and passed away. This was around 6.45 p.m. on May 12th. His death occurred during the continuous night period when no flights were allowed in or out, so Marx's body had to be kept in a freezer. Winter had settled in, conditions weren't great. Basically, it's like The Shining. Once winter sets in, you're locked in. Yeah. And that's, you, like, nothing comes in or out. You have local supplies, and that's what you got. It is, it's still, even in the modern era, a very dangerous place to go, because you don't yeah. know what could happen. So the National Science Foundation informed the public that Marx had passed away from natural causes. 
but it was unknown what exactly caused Marx's death for six months until his body could be flown to New Zealand. In fact, Christchurch, New Zealand, for a proper autopsy. Again, that was six months later. He was kept on ice. Yeah, I wonder what that does to the body. Yes. I mean, it's just... Normally, you want to get in there as fast as possible. So that mm -hmm. way you... Ah, man. Freezing, it's going to destroy a lot of tissues. Yeah. I mean, again, I'm also not a doctor, but I'm just going off of instinct here. Like, I could imagine certain chemicals could have half-lives. Exactly. I mean, even though it's frozen, you know, like... I still don't know the length of a, like, a chemical within the body. Right. And who knows in terms of, like, I don't know, blood cell counts, all that kind of... Like, it all just drastically changes with not just time, but also the temperature that the body was left in. Absolutely. Man. And task force, I know there's a lot of forensics scientists, investigators, like folks in the task force that just know forensics as well. Let us know what you think if you have instincts as we kind of unfold this case and talk about the theories. Hit us up on social at Red Web Pod. We'd love to hear from you. So now let's move on to the investigation. The autopsy in New Zealand found that Marx had died from methanol poisoning. Methanol is known as a wood alcohol. It's used for fuel, pesticides, paint, to make formaldehyde, antifreeze, among many other things that one should not consume. It's highly flammable, it's colorless, and it smells and tastes very similar to alcohol, which is an interesting note. The report showed that he had drunk, supposedly, 150 milliliters of methanol. That's about the equivalent of maybe a soda can or a small glass of wine. The coroner, Richard McElraya, found needle marks on Marx's arms, but no drugs in the toxicology report. It's unknown if the marks were from when Thompson gave him a sedative, if they were recreational in some manner, or if they had some other nefarious origin. It just isn't known, but we do know that there are some needle marks on his arm. I believe two. It could have been like allergy shots or something. But then again, you take that on your butt cheek or like your uh, stomach, but... True. You know, there are recreational times you use using little needles. Right. Eczema shots. Yeah. yeah. For a lot of things. A lot of things. While he was known to drink to deal with the symptoms of Tourette's syndrome, alcohol was not shown in his autopsy. There was methanol in a solvent used to clean the telescopes, but he would have had to drink a lot of that for the amount that was in his blood. Basically, it wasn't like straight methanol that was used to clean the telescopes. It was a some sort of fluid that had it in there. Yeah. And so in order to get that... I diluted vitamin, with other things as well. Yeah. He would have really had to cram a lot of that down. And I don't... Mm, that would have been tough, suffice to say. It also would have been incredibly distasteful, probably oh, very bet. painful, but yeah. So even though this chemical has like an alcoholic flavor to it, there wasn't like a, just a jar of it or like an abundance of it. That is a great question. We don't have Christian with us today. I yeah. do have Jillian on the horn. I'm going to send that to her on our messenger. But that's a great question. Because otherwise, from what I've heard from the case, what I've read, there hasn't been a known just pure methanol canister or some right. sort of vessel holding it somewhere that we know of. We just, that just thinks, makes things even more mysterious. Yeah. So suffice to say, we really don't know how this amount of methanol got into his system. My inclination when I first heard about this case was that could you inject it into a person? Was that what the injection sites were? But then why wouldn't he say something about this? Also, that would be a lot, though. Yeah. To inject. It would be. Now, the tricky laws and debated authority of Antarctica have made investigating this case difficult. And because of that, it took multiple years. It is... Wait, what? What? I don't know I if it's... like that's just us getting in our own damn way. Right. Well, he's an Australian person, so he's like, well, you know, that government's trying to step in to say like, hey, we should be able to investigate what happened to our own citizen, but yeah. then like whoever owns the base is kind of like the US is probably like, yeah, but that's our jurisdiction. It happened on our quote soil, but then everybody else in the world's kind of like, well, it's Antarctica, it's unincorporated, it's it's scientific yeah. land, like so we there are processes to get there, but it's not necessarily anyone's jurisdiction so it's it's really wishy-washy yeah and but i but i agree with you as a human being i'm kind of like uh somebody needs to just get to the bottom of this right and like i mean just imagine out. being a family member just mm -hmm. like i don't stop your bickering stop your fighting i just want answers like get yeah. to the bottom of this like, like that's what matters here there's a person that passed away right why now before we move on too far again we know that methanol was on site in various things like the telescope cleaner but you asked if it was around in pure like yeah volume. Up, uh, yeah mm -hmm. 
So Jillian said this, most likely since it was a common lab chemical with this to say, quote, Wormold would eventually learn that Marx's workspace was notoriously messy. Bottles of lab agents like methanol and ethanol were often strewn about alongside a dozen or so empty bottles of alcohol. So she said, yes. Turns out in his lab space specifically, there seemed to be a good amount of ethanol and methanol, which again- are Next to alcohol. Next to alcohol. What? So is he not of sound mind and body? We don't know. Is he in his lab and he grabs the bottle and takes a swig and goes on? Like, who knows? That would be like three or four shots worth if he's doing it that way. But, but yeah. Which is completely doable. Yeah. We'll pin that as we kind of head towards the theories. But I mean, when he went to the doctor, he- didn't seem like he knew what was going on. It wasn't like, doctor, I drank a bunch of methanol, you know? Right. I mean, he might have just thought, again, like, it tasted like alcohol, smelled like alcohol. Yeah, for sure. But it, in terms of just like, you know, I know it kind of eliminates the whole like, oh, it was an accident. I found out it was an accident. Mm. Or even kind of like lessens my thought on being like, you know, trigger word warning here, but like suicide. You know? Yeah, yeah. Because then you're going to seek help, and then you want to get better. And at that point, you just be like, "Doctor, I drank this. I regret it." So, I don't know. That yeah. kind of, that, that kind of skews like some theories a little further away from like what I think to be true. It definitely gives some some better context yeah. to the situation. Now, coming back to the idea of the laws and the authority and who owns what and what land is whose, all that sort of stuff. The U.S. did not formally acknowledge New Zealand's claim to the part of Antarctica where the base was located, the Ross Dependency. To clarify, the U.S. does not deny their claim either. They just didn't recognize it. It's one of those technicalities where they're just like, hear no evil, see no evil, and, yeah. but say nothing. Marx was also an Australian citizen, as I mentioned, so we have three nations in play at, at least. Detective Senior Sergeant Grant Wormold of New Zealand was investigating the case based on orders from McElroya, and both the U.S. and Australia did not agree with this. Again, we're going to have a lot of nation kind of yeah. bickering here. Since there, NSF had concluded earlier that Marx had died, again, of natural causes. He wanted access to any reports that they had on his death to try to either confirm or deny the NSF's original claim, but the NSF said no such report existed. 49 other people were working on the base at the time. Wormald requested information from them, these 49 people, and only got responses from 13. Like, why? Some I people guess. just don't want to get involved. Yeah, people don't want to get involved. And or maybe they just don't know anything. Don't know stuff, don't want to pick sides. Yeah. Many of Marx's belongings had already been thrown out months earlier, so that prevented those from being used as evidence. They're like, all right, well, he's passed away. It's natural causes. We need his space back. It's limited spaces here. Chuck it out. Yeah, I guess it was if it was confirmed to be natural causes. Right. Then it's like, all right, like it's not my job to. You know, it's all figured out. Yeah, I mean, like there is an ongoing investigation, I guess, or they're waiting for an autopsy. But I guess a lot of people are just going like, I eh, mean, it sucks, but like we got to move on. They said natural causes, so let's just believe it. I don't know. So Wormold, as he's investigating, believes foul play could not be ruled out. He knows the NSF said natural causes, but he's like he's feeling something. There might be foul play in the air. He told Men's Journal in 2017 this, quote, Common Sense told us there were only four possibilities as to how Rodney came to ingest the methanol. One, that he drank it willingly and knowingly with the intention of getting a high. Two, that he took it to end his own life. Three, that he took it accidentally. And finally, that someone had spiked his drink, possibly as a prank or even knowing that it would either make him very ill or kill him, end quote. There is still no formal verdict on Wormald's investigation, and his full 50-page report was released in 2016. I always find it so interesting that, like, with stuff like that or just, like, government things, it's like, oh, I, I just wait a certain amount of time, and then it will be released yeah. to the public. It's always mm -hmm. such an interesting thing to me. Yeah, I guess he couldn't make a claim, but he's like, listen, I investigated. So, I mean, these are the these are the angles we're going to kind of assess this from. Yeah. I mean, it's also, it just seems like, it's like, well, that's just every angle. <laughs> it's, it's every angle, right? It's like, well, listen here, I've been investigating this for years, and the answer is either yes, no, or maybe. Right, exactly. Like, great. Exactly. Right, yeah. Those are, exactly. Those are the that's options. Almost said. <laughs> um, but yeah, we're going to assess each of those angles and... What lies in the camp of each of those angles? What supports that particular claim, and what yeah, maybe the wrinkles? Yeah, I'm interested to see are. like 
like essentially, right? There's just going to be a, we have a bag of weight off to the side. And there's all these different scales, and each scale represents a different theory. We're just gonna. I just want to see where the weight goes. Yeah. On scale. Yeah. This episode of Red Web is sponsored by BetterHelp. Around New Year's, people can get obsessed with how to change themselves instead of just expanding on what they're already doing right. Maybe they finally organized one part of their space and now they want to tackle another. Or maybe they're taking supplements every morning and now they want to actually eat breakfast too. Therapy helps you find your strengths so you can ditch the extreme resolutions and make changes that really stick. Therapy is a phenomenal resource for anybody who is experiencing any kind of struggles with mental health or mental well-being, or even if you just want to establish a system to maintain your mental health and mental well-being. Having a certified professional to be able to talk things through with is an invaluable resource. It's like having a personal trainer, but for your brain. If you're thinking about starting therapy, BetterHelp is a great option. It's entirely online and designed to be convenient and flexible. All you have to do is fill out a survey and they'll match you with a licensed therapist. Plus, you can switch therapists at any time. Celebrate the progress you've already made. Visit BetterHelp.com slash RedWeb today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash RedWeb. This episode of Red Web is sponsored by Shady Rays. Shady Rays is an independent sunglasses brand that has over 250,000 five-star reviews. They are on a mission to match affordability with durability, making top quality shades accessible to everyone. They have tons of styles and colors to pick from, so finding the perfect polarized shades is a breeze. If you game or stare at screens all day, they also have blue light glasses to level up your gaming style and reduce eye strain. I'm a big fan of Shady Rays. I have a pair that I keep in my car. They're a wonderful shade of blue, and I love busting them out when they're the nice, bright, sunny days. They look good, they feel good, and they have a nice little bag that they come in that you can store them in so you can protect the lenses from getting any kind of scratches on them. If you don't love your shades, exchange or return them for free within 30 days. There's no risk when you shop. Exclusively for Task Force members, Shady Rays is giving out their best deal. Head to ShadyRays.com and use code REDWEB for 35% off polarized sunglasses and snow goggles. Try for yourself the shades rated 5 stars by over 250,000 people. This episode of Red Web is sponsored by Henson Shaving. Are you all too familiar with the pains of using a cheap razor or the annoyance of subscription razors? That's where Henson Shaving comes in. Henson Shaving is a family-owned aerospace parts manufacturer that has made parts for the ISS, that's the International Space Station, and Mars Rover, and now they are bringing precision engineering to your shaving experience. By using aerospace-grade CNC machines, Henson makes metal razors that extend just 0.0013 inches, which is less than the thickness of a human hair. That means a secure and stable blade with a vibration-free shave. And it gets better. The razor has built-in channels to evacuate hair and cream, which makes clogging virtually impossible. And in my opinion, the best part? The affordability. You're getting $5 a year in blades for Henson shaving. There's nothing better. It's time to say no to subscriptions and yes to a razor that'll last you a lifetime. Visit HensonShaving.com slash RedWeb to pick the razor for you and use code RedWeb and you'll get two years worth of blades free with your razor. Just to make sure you add them to your cart. That's 100 free blades when you head to H-E-N-S-O-N-S-H-A-V-I-N-G dot com slash RedWeb and use code RedWeb. <laughs> So, uh, like I said, we're going to be living in the theories now. There's a there's a good amount of meat on these bones here to 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 get into and assess. So, let's start with one of the earlier theories, that of suicide. So, one early theory after the autopsy was that Marx knowingly drank methanol to end his own life. The long, harsh night in Antarctica can lead to mental health troubles. The endless days and nights can also affect your circadian rhythm, causing bad sleep cycles, which can contribute again to mental illness. Being in such remote and isolated areas away from family can also contribute to this. So there are a long list of factors that could lead to somebody being of a wrong mind or body, right? So Marx had lived in Antarctica before. He could have been familiar with these conditions and he was kind of in the midst of this current stay. He was from November of 99 to November of 2000 was kind of going to be his stay. And this all went down in May. So he's about halfway through this, this leap. But suffice to say, he's also at the end of this six-month run of night. So yeah, it's the maximum like amount. There. I have this question to ask. Yes. This is for you and Nick. 
Now, would you, if you had to spend an entire month, would it rather be in a little base camp in Antarctica, a space shuttle in space, <sighs> oh god, or a submarine? Oh, oh man, <laughs> Antarctica. Oh. Antarctica, Antarctica for sure. Yeah. I, I, claustrophobia out yeah. in oh, yeah. space, Antarctica. underwater. No, no I've been no. working too hard on these muscles lately. I don't want the atrophy of space. I don't want the... <laughs> we got a, a colleague who's showing his muscles in the window just right showing now. showing his muscles right now. He just came up to yeah. the window to the, to the podcast room. He's part of the security team. Yeah, yeah, He's yeah. He's just, yeah. just showing us and making sure that right. the security staying strong. <laughs> right, right. He brought us back to Earth is what he did. Yeah. But yeah. like, and then the, you know, bone density, radiation and all that. Like oh. space would be fun. A month, yeah. yeah. You know, I'd like to stretch my legs a little bit more than that. <laughs> yeah, floating around would be fun though. And submarine is just no go. Yeah, I mean, submarine is just <laughs> claustrophobia like, hell no. central. Hell no. <laughs> You're at risk of some sort of like secret war espionage. Oh. Coming up and down from space has a lot of danger to it. So I'm just yeah. like, you know what? <laughs> Antarctica. I'll, I'll kick it in a really insulated room <laughs> in Antarctica. Pick up a video game that uh -huh. has like 80 hours worth of gameplay yeah. in it. Okay. I, you know what? It's going to be like yeah. a thing. I'm going to learn to play chess against a computer. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a thing. Yeah. Let us know uh, Task Force at Red Web Pod. What would you do, Fredo? I, I would be in Antarctica. Yeah. Yeah. Is that I what could, you said, oh, Nick? Yeah, yeah, so we're, yeah, all, yeah. we're all cold yeah, boys. I can still bench press in, in, in the cold. <laughs> yeah. And we're good there. Yeah. yeah. I think space would be the best experience, though. Yes. I think that would be the greatest experience. Honestly, though, like if I had to really think about it and pick one, I'd probably would go space. I would want to make dangers, space work. Because that, but, that is so unique and so magical. Yeah. Like for the human mind to see the planet like that, I, just, I think it would be really. Very few people. It'd be awesome. Would have that. Experience. I think it'd be truly awesome. Yeah. Now, as we're kind of talking about all of these factors with Antarctica that go to kind of impact the mind of somebody who's there, it is worth saying that one of Rodney's colleagues from New Zealand told the New Zealand Herald this, quote, Rodney liked it so much he wanted to go back again. In fact, Rodney had a fiance, a successful career. He had no major debts. So a lot of people were wondering, okay, what might be his motivation? That being said, at the same time, you know, he had lived there now at this point twice. And so despite everything kind of maybe going your way or feeling nice and swimmingly from an outside perspective, you can never really know yeah. what's going on inside yeah. someone's head. And it could still eventually, even like, I love Antarctica, at least on that one trip, it could still get to you because of these reasons. Yeah. You know? It just seems less likely, right? Yeah. You can never, again, to, to be fully above board, know. you can never know what someone's going through. You can never know what's in someone's mind. You, it's it's not safe to just make assumptions about loved ones and, oh, yeah. well, everything th seems fine. That's right. just not how depression works. Mm -hmm. Now, when Marx's symptoms started, he seemed shocked and confused, like that these were surprises to him. And so that does kind of offer a wrinkle in the idea that this was a planned, self-inflicted event. Yeah, that's what I was getting at earlier. I was like, it just seems so surprised. I don't know. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And you kind of mentioned this too, but if he had changed his mind after symptoms had started, he probably would have said something to Dr. Thompson. But obviously, we can't guarantee that. You never know what someone's thinking or what they decide to do, but it does seem to be intuitive. Yeah. Now, visiting the doctor multiple times with shock and confusion does seem like, again, a surprising, like a surprising event to him and that he did not intend to die in this type of way. The methanol poisoning could have affected his thought processes as well as his memory. So again, there's a lot of wrinkles on wrinkles here, and it's why it's such an open case. Interesting. Of course, of course. When you when you sit there and you go, well, okay, like, mm -hmm. if it was suicide and or an accident, or, you know, if it was an accident or you wanted to go back on what he did, be like, doctor, this happened, but... Of course, a small chance, memory loss. Oh, yeah. Like, ah. Absolutely. And this is why these are mysteries. Yep. And this leads us kind of to the next major theory that many have theorized, that it was simply an accident. And, you know, we were talking about this, and I asked Jillian earlier, kind of silently off to the side, we were talking about accidentally ingesting the methanol because we had beakers on the counter. He was known to have drunk alcohol for various reasons. And so I'm thinking if this is an accident, how long does it take to set in? Because let's say he accidentally imbibes it, thinking it's some sort of other alcohol. Then he goes, all right, day's over, time to walk back. My understanding, and again, I'm not a chemist or a scientist, but I always thought it was a, it would take a little longer for methanol to set in. And it does, but there's a window of time, anywhere between one and 72 hours before methanol really starts to manifest oh, symptoms goodness. in you. But here's the thing, though. 
right? Like, if I had all these things happen to me, mm -hmm. I go to the doctor, doctor can't explain it. Uh, I would start retracing my steps. My like, doctor, I was working with these chemicals. Or right. I, I was drinking alcohol next to open containers of these chemicals. Mm -hmm. you, know, you throw everything at the wall. Right. You know what I mean? Or doctor, and we don't know that this didn't happen, but the doctor should ask too. Right. Have you had anything recently that you don't normally have? Yeah. Did, did you have alcohol in an empty stomach? Did I mean, you, you, know? I, you know, if I'm vomiting blood, doctor doesn't know, I'm telling him everything. I'm like, doctor, my, my sh this morning was slightly darker brown than it usually is. You right. know what I mean? Like just anything. It was neon red. Right. Just trying to figure out anything that right. could just spike some type of train of thought to follow right i don't want to paint the doctor as like dismissive in any way oh we no, just no, no, know no, no. like that they had an inclination and then sent him it's, home, it's less on the doctor and more on on him sure. to just be like it, these were the chemicals that were at my right. disposal during the last i don't know the couple days right yeah but i'm just trying to say too there's there's a lot of nuance that i'm sure was not reported within oh, those you know, definitely. conversations but suffice to say if this was an accident you know the theory goes on to say that maybe marx was making some sort of homemade alcohol and drank it without realizing it wasn't right. This is something I actually recently learned. People go to classes to learn how to make vodkas, gins, and all these other things. And my fiance and I, with a couple friends of ours, decided to make some gin. And, and it was like, you can kind of imbibe it with whatever flavors you want. So we were kind of experimenting here. But one thing I learned in that process is that some of the first stuff that gets distilled out as you're trying to make the alcohol and make the gin is ethanol. Like the first kind of few layers of it like you have to just pour out the sink because oh. if you've ever heard tales of people having moonshine and going blind yeah. that's because they don't kick off the ethanol layer that you have to dump off and so if you drink that it can yeah it can attack your eyes and, and you will go blind oh my goodness and so you know a little anecdotal experience to say that if he's trying to make something yeah and he didn't know that i mean good sounds like a fun experience also i could just buy the alcohol <laughs> that's true but he's in antarctica yeah. maybe he's got some spuds and he's like, I want to make some of that cool potato vodka. Yeah, I've heard that's so much true. about. You got nothing, you know. You, you go by your day, and there's really nothing else to do. Yeah. So, with all that to say, methanol and ethanol are both used to make homemade alcohol. Making homemade alcohol is reportedly a common hobby of scientists and researchers in the Antarctic, probably because of the lack of accessibility, as, yeah. you, as we were kind of saying. But since methanol smells and tastes similar to alcohol, and it's colorless, Marx would not maybe have known that he was consuming too much of this byproduct as opposed to the target product being alcohol. There's a slight difference between the smell and the taste of methanol and alcohol. I don't want to say it's like identical, but it's open to theory that maybe Marx didn't know the exact difference. It's more subtle than you think. Yeah, I certainly wouldn't know. But again, though, I feel like you mentioned that to the doctor. I was making my own alcohol. Sure. Days ago. I was drinking my own stuff. Yeah. And it's my first batch. I feel like that's... One of the leading, the things you'd lead off with. Yeah. It's also worth knowing that colleagues of Marx had said that he was a very smart person. He was very careful. He was very experienced as a researcher. We're not just talking about like a regular guy. He's, he's very studied, right? He's very smart. And this yeah. is kind of why he's down there. And so it wouldn't make a lot of sense for him on one hand, maybe to choose this as a self-harm method because it would be an incredibly painful way to go, unfortunately. And then on the other hand, it seems like if this was a hobby that he had taken on, that he would have known the ins and outs of it and been very, very careful about it. I mean, I'll be honest, that does make a good point, though, right? Like but what it, if you were, what if you were inebriated while making it, though? Oh, come on, it's just irresponsible as all hell. Right, right. Accidents do be happening. I, I, I will say though, like that's a good point too. Like if he's, you know, this is someone that's just an intelligent person. Right, mm -hmm. if they're deciding to take their own life, I mean, that's they would be knowledgeable in this, right? Yeah, they would know, or at least be that kind of person, right? They're cerebral enough to be like to look at it, and it, like I said, to, to look at it in a cerebral way, and then try and figure out like, or at least figure out the least harmful way, and then also realize that this is a harmful, like very harmful right. way. Yeah, and I mean, again, we're going back now to the other theory, but it's the surprise of it all. And yeah, and this this theory also has its wrinkles as well, you know, because multiple bottles of alcohol were found in his room, and so now it's sup supposition, right? We're all kind of, as we're attempting to theorize, or I guess we're dissecting the theories of others, as people are theorizing, it, we're trying to fill in gaps with assumptions and, yeah. and all of that. And so, like, okay, sure, maybe he did this and it was an accident, but also, like, why would he have made stuff? Because he has his own alcohol in his room. Oh well. 
you know, maybe because he wanted to have a hobby and he wanted to try something different. All viable, but all just as like up in the air as anything right. else, yeah. you know? It's a really tough one. So suffice to say, this idea of an accident is not impossible, but perhaps unlikely. Some have also tried to make homemade alcohol and accidentally used methanol on the base in, in the past. So this isn't like unheard of. Yeah. Again, common practice. Alternatively, the methanol may have been mislabeled as something else, whether maliciously or accidentally, and it could have easily been labeled as ethanol, which is safe for consumption, which ethanol has its own entire history, but it is used to make alcohol and bread. Both chemicals are very common in labs, which, of course, everybody here would have access to, which leads us to the next theory, because many people believe that Rodney Marx was murdered or that foul play of some kind was involved in his death. Someone could have purposefully added methanol to something Marx was drinking. Symptoms of methanol poisoning can take between one to 72 hours to set in. There's a huge gap of time where this could have left it open to somebody interfacing with him and having this happen. My gut instinct says that if it was on his way back from the lab, it might have aired on the shorter side, the quicker side of that 72 hour window because maybe it happened while he was in the lab, while there was easy accessibility to methanol, no matter what it was in, and then on his way back, that's when it's metabolizing because that's what it is based on, yeah. how, how quickly it gets metabolized. I mean, I'm interested to see if there's any motive that comes into play with this, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. No one really does stuff like that for no reason. I mean, it happens, obviously, more often than you think, but, like, you would think that, the, the, you know, based like this, everyone knows each other, there'd be some reason. 100%. It's less like that someone just like, I just feel like doing this. Uh, you know what? Yeah. I want a change of pace today. Yeah. yeah. No, that... And that's, and that's the thing, and to be totally candid on that front, we don't know if Marx had any enemies on base. There's no one with a real obvious motive on base to have done something so heinous. And if it's true that this is what happened to Marx, his death would be the first recorded murder in Antarctica. First confirmed death, if this theory were true. Jeez, yeah. I'm sure, like, most deaths there are just, like, environmental, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Or just, like, natural causes or something. Yeah. So while we can't think of any enemies or anybody that might have direct motive, the only things we can actually assess on this front are, what are the repercussions? What come with the, as it were, sick pros and cons of someone like this passing away? What could, what could possibly happen, right? Well, the main thing that would happen is that Astro, the project, would, would be down because he was the only person there that knew how to operate the telescope. Does anyone benefit from that? Does anyone lose from that? Those are the questions that are openly worth asking to see if there is a motive floating around. Yeah. I mean, again, kind of rhetorical questions, but really the kind of angle that you have to assess if one is to believe that there is murder or foul play involved. That just, I mean, like, I can't, like to have the station go down, I guess the research take a hiatus. I don't know. Like, yeah. It just seems. Like, oh, we don't want Australia to know about the star Sirius. Right. It just seems so random. Yeah. It's interesting. You know, I mean, this does combine then this theory and the last one, but it is possible that someone murdered Marx, if not entirely by accident. This kind of combines the two by saying that maybe for some reason, methanol got mixed in with something like alcohol or, or something meant to be imbibed. And Marx just was the unwitting and unexpected victim of that accident. So again, now it takes the accident out of his hands and puts it into somebody else's hands. And then he just ends up being the victim but there's no way of knowing since six months had passed before his autopsy and his 49 other colleagues have all, by that point, moved back across the globe. Oh, damn. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, even then, like, if you were to have suspects, everyone's scattered. Yeah. Makes a case like this really hard to kind of chase down. When the autopsy is super delayed, 13 out of 49 are willing to say something or have something to say. And then, yeah, they move back across the world. Yeah, man. I mean, solving cases... Are, is difficult already as is like this is just all the cards are stacked against you mm -hmm. so now let's move on to uh one of the meteor theories that this might have been some level of cover-up or that what happened here and its truth was covered up let's talk about that so while the u.s and new zealand had separate investigations when the u.s department of justice reached out to the national science foundation and Raytheon Polar Services, neither entity provided the Department of Justice with information. Wormold, the New Zealand police officer mentioned earlier, theorizes that they may have been withholding information, perhaps maliciously, 
Wormold claims that the NSF told him no reports of their internal investigation exist. And according to Men's Journal, he was, quote, drip-fed information for years. He also believes that the reason why so few researchers responded to his questioning was that they were worried about losing their jobs. So my take is that if you don't have anything to say, don't clog up the works with miscellaneous, I don't know, but here's what I think. Right. But he, he's got a valid point. 49 folks out there, very unique experiences to be out there, very cool opportunities for professional scientists and researchers. Maybe they don't want to ruin that. Maybe they want the opportunity to continue to do that again or at least not be blackballed in their own industry, but perhaps. Because these are national departments. These are national entities they're working with, not just like a company. Right. Now, some NSF employees did reach out to Wormold and criticize Dr. Thompson's care. William Silva, a doctor at another Antarctic research station, reviewed Thompson's notes. So Thompson had an ectochem blood analyzer, which would have detected the methanol in Marx's blood. Thompson's ectochem was off at the time of Marx's death and would have taken about eight to 10 hours to turn back on because its internal battery was dead. That is to say, unless he had left the machine on 24 seven, then it would have been self-sufficient, I suppose, keeping itself charged, but I digress. He previously reported this to Raytheon, and it's unknown if they responded. Thompson claimed he was too busy with Marx to use the machine and that it was difficult to use, but Silva claimed the opposite. He suggested that Thompson read the manual or contact the manufacturer if it was so difficult to operate. Basically, you have one doctor saying to another, listen, I know this is hindsight, but you have a device that could have diagnosed rapidly what was going on inside Marx's body. Could have picked up on that high level of methanol in his blood and maybe done something about it, but instead you left this device dead didn't charge it up, didn't keep it operating, and then you claimed, well, I was either too busy, but also it's it's not it's difficult to use. And he's like, well, if it's so difficult, which right. it's not, he says, then learn it. Yeah. That's your job. That's your job. So this is a very fascinating point that Dr. Silva brings up. Ooh. Again, it is hindsight. It is guided by hindsight. Oh, it's 100%, but like, if that is your job and you have all this equipment, mm -hmm. like... Like, you're not in a city. You Hell, you're not even in, like, a dense town, right? How many people on a daily basis are coming to you and filling your schedule? I mean, it's just assumption. But filling, if, if like, your sole purpose is to attend to the physical needs of the individuals on this base camp, how much of your time is being taken up by their visits, their requests? You know what right. I mean? Like, you got time to learn this machine. You got time to at least keep the damn thing charged. Like, there's no excuse for that. There's no excuse to have it charged. Like, if I don't know how to operate something and I'm a medical professional, the thing's still going to be charged. I'm still going to make sure all the tools are functional. Mm -hmm. It happens sometimes where a doctor goes, I'm pretty certain this is it. I'm not going to bother, you know, yeah. running your blood and doing all this stuff because I think I got you figured out. But that's when, you know, our instinct started kicking in and going like, he's coming back two more times after that moment. Maybe it is worth expanding the search. Oh, the vomiting of blood, man. Right. I just like how... It's a bit it, of a red flag. Maybe I just don't know, but is that just, you know, it's like, is that something that occurs at the hospital and doctors are just like, oh, no, it's actually... I don't know. Is it not as big of a deal as I think it is? Right. You're like, oh, another one of these again. All right. I'm like, oh, that's just fine. You just Take some of this and call me in the morning. Yeah, I just consume too many hot dogs. Just it happens. Eat a Band-Aid. Like, you know? Yeah. Right. I mean, again, I, mean, I know nothing about right, exactly. nothing. I, it could, it could it be just, mundane. It could be, it, I don't know. It seems alarmist to me, but we're yeah, not same. doctors. Yeah. So Dr. Silva is saying that if Thompson had realized Marx was suffering from methanol poisoning, he could have easily treated him. There are two major ways that you treat methanol poisoning. One is to give, I'm going to struggle with the pronunciation of this one, fomepazole. And the other is, ironically, to give them ethanol, which was widely available on this base. The reason you would give either of these two items is because it would then prevent the metabolite formate from forming. Basically, it would stop methanol from turning into its toxic byproduct. And it's, it's that toxic byproduct that then would harm you. Right. So it basically stopped the process in its tracks. You wouldn't have a great time, Yeah. but you but could I at mean, least, you know... It'll possibly save your life. Yeah, because it's already in the blood system. You're, you're past the pump the stomach situation. But suffice to say, Dr. Silva is saying that if he had known about this and if he had used this equipment, 
he could have at least treated him and perhaps saved his life. After that, Thompson never really responded to these criticisms from Silva and was actually not charged with medical negligence because there's nothing really to go off of. But interestingly, he was actually evacuated from Antarctica later that very same year after a fall in the autumn of 2000. That was the same year, right? And reportedly, Thompson had since disappeared since he could not be reached during the later parts of the inquiry, this investigation that unfolded. So he fell down, had an accident in some way, was injured, flown out, and then disappeared, was unable to be reached, unable to be found. And I don't know if that is mysterious or if that's sinister, but it's something worth noting. Yeah. Or just probably just didn't, you know, realizing now that like he could have done something. Right. He's like, I'm free. I'm off that place. I fell. I bumped my knee and now I have a protuberance. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Again, I don't want to come too hard after this guy because it's all hindsight for us, but it is interesting. It's unfortunate though. Yeah. Harry Mahar, an NSF health and safety coordinator from the Antarctic program, told Wormwald that the NSF did multiple internal investigations, including when they tested containers marked as methanol or alcohol to see if the labels were accurate. Ooh, I love this. Love that. Basically going like, all right, let's get in there. Let's see if things were mislabeled. Let's see if things were mixed up. This meant that a report of some kind did indeed exist. So it does cast some weird shadows on the NSF. Why are you saying there's no reports? Why aren't you handing over any paperwork if somebody under your employee is is saying that there was at least some investigation happening? Wormald found out later that the homemade alcohol found on base tested negative for methanol. So this was immediately... Like, had to outright drink it then. Mm-hmm. Seems like it. But it is weird that this information was withheld and then later found in a different direction and it was confirmed that it did exist. It could fall into the whole like US versus Australia versus New Zealand situation. I don't know. And they're just like, no, no, no. I'm not going to give you this information. All right, then I guess we won't figure out what happened here. Right. Right. Then I'm going to stip my foot down. It's like the squid game, the challenge. Like, yeah. I don't want the umbrella door. Okay, I, I guess we're all going home then. I saw, I saw that episode. Ugh. I saw that. God. Frustrating. It happened like three times. Sorry for spoilers, anybody. <laughs> Uh, so coming back to Mahar, he noticed that Wormald's report included a unique bottle of liquor in Mark's room with a non-English label that was then thrown away. It was discovered in the trash can, I guess. Colleagues believe that Mark obtained the bottle and may have been spiked with methanol to increase the potency. Cases like this have been reported all over the world. So basically saying that, you know, he had a, a strange bottle of alcohol. It had been thrown away because it had been consumed, but maybe to make it stronger, he, he like threw in a little bit of this and that. But again, that just that's an accident then. And then it's just like, well, Doc, yeah, I spiked my alcohol, methanol. Well, maybe he's embarrassed. Maybe he doesn't want to talk about that. Maybe he, he doesn't he, want to. He's sh- literally spewing blood. You can't. Right. You I know you, you got to tell your doctors these things because it is for your own benefit. But I'm just trying to say like. Who wants to who wants to admit like hey I might have a problem or hey I might have been chasing I mean I would admit height. that to a doctor. Yeah. I mean you know what I mean there's yeah. uh patient confidentiality involved there. That's, that's true. That's you know, true. I'm not like talking to <laughs> like a podcast right. and giving out all my information. You're not tweeting it or something. Y- yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean that's an interesting angle. Especially cuz what no you know uh fiance you said waiting at home. Yes. I mean <sighs> It's hard. It's hard to yeah. think that like embarrassment connects to like the reason why. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I think you know if that is what happened. And again, it comes back to the accident theory for me. Maybe he was like, you know what? I could use a little extra strength on this. I know scientifically I can add this amount and it will be safe. Maybe you then limit how much you could have at a time. So you're like, well, if I can only have two, two, I don't know, I'll make it up, two shots, uh, yeah. then I want it to hit me a certain level. So I'll add a little this and that. But then when you're in that stupor, you're, you know, your decision making is a little slippery, a little loosed up. And then you're like, well, you know, I'll have a little bit more and then a little bit more. And then you forgot the whole time that you had put in methanol and then it builds up in your system. And again, accident comes to mind most prominently for me. Yeah, but that's just to me is, is someone that would go to the doctor and be like, this is what happened. Yeah. You know, especially when you have something like there's a reason to live, right? It's all assumptions. So sure. Again, yep. But like on an ordinary basis, this that that just the typical path there would be I messed up. I go mm-hmm. to a doctor and then help me doctor, unmess it up. 
this is how I messed up. Yeah. Help me undo this. Like, yeah. I have a fiance waiting at home. Right. Now, remember, we're talking about a cover up. So I, while I want to subscribe this to an accident, let's put this through the lens of perhaps a cover up. So if something were to be mislabeled and or the medical services or other aspects of the base were negligent, then it would make sense. It would probably be in their best interest, cynically, that the NSF or even Raytheon would not want that information getting out and making their research look bad, looking like that something was going on under their purview that they just weren't aware yeah. of or, or anything like that. Regardless of how exactly Marx came to consume all of this methanol, it, it doesn't really matter because the investigation itself was so disorganized due to the unclear laws of the South Pole that I think it is the complications therein that make it hard to truly figure out the origin of it all, yeah. right? Regardless of, again, how he came to do it, the fact is he did in some way. Yeah. And we'll never know because of the rigmarole of international politics or, I don't know, it, it feels so silly to me. I, I'm with you on that. I mean, maybe you don't want to set weird precedents for other things down the future yeah. line that you can't plan for, but like, come on, let's figure this out together and move on. We're all allies, right? Now, the coroner did release his own report in 2008 and said, quote, I respectively disagree that accidental poisoning and even foul play can be adequately disregarded without a full and proper investigation. And he did advocate for clear rules for crimes committed in Antarctica. And I think that this is, that's the precedent that should have been set from an unfortunate case like this. Yeah. You know, let's figure out the actual protocol for a, yes, rare instance of true crime moment in the uh, Antarctic, but let's at least come up with a procedure moving forward so this can never happen again. In closing, there is a mountain in the Worcester Mountain Range, which is a mountain range in the 2600 meter realm. It's a very tall mountain range. And it was actually named after Rodney Marks, this mountain, Mount Marks. Marks' parents appreciated the efforts of the New Zealand investigation, but they believe they will never get the answers as to exactly how their son died. And that is the death of Rodney Marks. A lot of theories, a lot of angles, and again, a lot of supposition, a lot of trying to fill in the gaps, to try to figure out what went on. But I think at the end of the day, something happened. He consumed something he shouldn't have. It ended up in his system. And because of these weird lack of rules and guidelines, we'll just never be able to pinpoint what happened. Yeah, I don't think it was a conscious decision. I think, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I just, I don't, I don't know. I, I think for me, I could like X that out of the equation. But what a, what a mystery. Just a, a simple, I mean, not necessarily really simple, but just like, it seems straightforward. It seems very straightforward. But the answer's just not. But, right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's one of the painful parts about doing a podcast like this. Yeah. You, you would hope so desperately that despite the unfortunate results of what happened to Rodney Marks, that, that you could at least go, okay, it's straightforward. Let's figure this out, right? We're at least testing these beakers, seeing if there's cross-contamination. Okay, there isn't? Cool. A little bit right. narrower of a lane. But again... That's yeah. why we're talking about it is because yep. it's one of those cold cases that just like left open frustratingly and we're going right. to analyze the possibilities. What what episode is this now for Red Web? 171. 171. Mm -hmm. I feel like if someone came to us with a time machine, they're like, all right, you can go, here's a time machine, go back in time. Like, where are you, like, where are you going to go? Like, what are you going to start? I'm like, bro, I got 171 places to go. <laughs> <laughs> like off the, right off the bat right like you know what i mean like <laughs> to be the fly on the snowflake to figure out what exactly happened on right. this one. Oh my god you, you know what like that's that would be really interesting i've thought about that multiple times just in the back of my head like to just know maybe if, even if the caveat is i can't share but i can go no 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 i know yeah but like oh man just to satisfy that that even, scratch yeah, in the back of my brain just for myself yeah I, I and then 172 would be the Marvel boardroom, just so I can see what they're cooking up next. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. 173 X gene. Where's it at? Yeah, what's well, going on what's with going it? On. How close are we to waking up my mutant powers? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Is there a, is there a case where like what if it what if it turned out like you're like okay cool mundane mundane expected strange but expected uh, et cetera et cetera. You're going through all the cases, then you get to like 56, and you're like wait a minute alien. And then it goes back to like, they did it, accident, somebody went missing, you know, like all that, just like back to normal, but then suddenly you have like an alien pop up. I, I feel like I really have, like say like, you know what I mean? The three of us, myself, Trevor, Nick, we have the ability to go back in time 
to to visit all these mysteries. I mm-hmm. feel like we'd have to before we step onto the ship. I someone would have to be like, guys, yeah, there's a good chance that there's <laughs> one of these is an alien, Ugh. right? Mm-hmm. One of these mm-hmm. is actually paranormal or a demon or you know what I mean, like. <sighs> There, there, there's a there's a fair <laughs> chance that like it is what it is. It is a paranormal <laughs> thing, and so ah uh, yeah, we'd have to brace ourselves Ooh. for what we're getting into. I feel like it would be life changing in terms of like how you see the world, perceive the world. It wouldn't just be oh that's how it happened. I feel like it'd be a real mission to Mars situation. I think that's the movie where I'm like I'm with you guys. We're all sobered astronauts going in with this mission of figuring out what happened in the past. But as soon as aliens crop up, I, I salute and I go, I'm going with them. Oh, really? And oh. I shoot off. And you're like, what, what, what a twist. Anyway, let's keep time traveling. <laughs> I, and I'm living with the beings from the great beyond. I'm mad. <laughs> And then they just rip me apart and they're like, let's figure out how this thing works. <laughs> well, the thing is, it's just a, like, I don't know how we, Nick and I come back and explain like to your partner, look, <laughs> he went off with some aliens. I like listen. They gotta have a time travel situation and some sort of immortality gun, right? Like I, I can go, boop, 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 boop. cool. I'll, uh, I'm good. I'm like he's, he's he's with some aliens right now. I yeah. don't know what else. And then to I say. time travel back in from a thousand years into the future, but I look the exact same the next day, and I go, no, 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 he's lying. <gasps> and I have all this advanced knowledge, and I can, whew, oof, oof, creepy. Run logical. We do not right. need. I'm that. going off the deep end. <laughs> oh, right, this but holiday brain we, rush coming in. We also don't need. Yeah, you know, yeah, let's scrap that. We don't need the the ability no. to to, no. to mess with that kind of stuff. No. we just don't. If, it, if it, we had time travel, you know, I'd have an accidental Jurassic Park situation. I'd go back. <laughs> I'd want to capture that T Rex in HD 4K, and then I'd probably get crunched. Yeah, you yeah. know, I want to be like, how big the feathers? Yeah. What are those arms doing? You know. Yeah, no, humans shouldn't be able to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I still maintain we've been time traveling this whole, this whole time from the far future, coming back and looking at ourselves like a, an actual living museum, and that's what UFOs are. Oh. Leave it to us to develop time travel, sophisticated uh, cloaking techniques, and anti-gravitational flying mechanisms that we then crash. <laughs> You yeah, know what I mean, yeah. it ain't going to be yeah. an ancient alien yeah. civilization that's got the no. brilliance to come here from God knows where. It's going to be us. And they're looking yeah. at us like, hey, you guys want to go back to the 1990s and see all the wacky colors and Nickelodeon? Yeah. No, I want to go back to, to uh, yeah, I guess like, I want, no, I want to go to Roswell and look at sand. I, I, I don't know what we're, why, why aliens are <laughs> going where they're going. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, anyway, I'm, again, I got a holiday brain mush task force. Thank you all so much. As always, we are, again, you're in the midst of the new year. I wish you well. I hope that the new year is, is amazing to you all. But we're about to go into the holiday season, so I'm still a little sentimental. And I just wanted to say thank you all so much for another amazing year of Red Web and listening to us and being task force members and and being first members. We've watched our first memberships grow. We have a Discord where we do Discord events exclusively for you guys. We do live streams every now and then where, where we call it field work, where we can test our ghost hunting prowess, our cryptid hunting prowess, and all that sort of stuff in the safety, the confines of a video game. You know, our podcast is ad-free. All that good stuff just for you, because you support our show, yeah. redwebpod.com slash first. And uh, if you've been listening for this long, get prepared. There might be some some little like group reading projects for the Dude, Fredo's cooking something up. You know, there might be some some watch, some some viewing projects. Some viewing projects. You know, so. Right. Suffice to say, Task Force, we're cooking up some goodness for you. Yeah, just some little bonus stuff. Oh, yeah. Get, just get into all the different entertainment stuff that we just all come to discuss oh, yeah. on this podcast. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you you know a few things, right? A lot of you have wanted us to flip the script where Fredo takes the role and then I'm the one reacting. You've talked to us about this being the movie podcast about mysteries. All the ingredients you know and love about Red Web. We're, we're pulling on them and making something brand new mixed in that, that brain of Alfredo's. Yeah, so good luck. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and buckle up. Buckle up. <laughs> All right, everybody. Task Force, thank you so much. And Fredo, I'll see you right back here next Monday for yet another mystery. Yes, you will, Trevor. Trevor.